Um, the main objectives for this chapter was really to understand how to extract relationships between the words mm -hmm. and also to understand how text, uh, certain text analyses can allow you to examine which words tend to follow other words. Right. And then and I'm looking this way because your little faces are on the completely right side of my monitor. So let me move you guys up so I don't <laughs> look weird. Um, okay. So, and then finally, the, the other objective was um, to understand how to analyze text to determine which words tend to co-occur. So not only do words, if words follow each other, but do they like co-occur in the same um, sentence or in the same context? Well, hmm. we doesn't really talk about context per se, but you'll see what I mean in a second. Okay. So the first section of this chapter was tokenizing words by engrams. Um, at this point in the book, I believe we are familiar with um, bigrams, right? So, or um, uni unigrams? Yeah, unigram. Yeah, exactly. So um, engrams is just a version of that where you can state explicitly in the argument how many words you want to keep together. Um, so in this uh, first part, we are going to try and um, see the, create the engrams by starting off with bigrams, but also illustrate that you can create trigrams as well. And we're, we start by using the um, Jane Austen, like the books um, as the other chapters are, well, I think the majority of this book except for the case studies use. Um, and that's simply by using the unnest tokens function. And you can specify here, you want a bigram, uh, sorry, not bigram, uh, n-gram and with uh, n equal to two, which is a bigram, mm. your first argument is going to be what the name of your new column is going to be. And then the second argument is the column that you're um, uh, manipulating in your text, what you're passing in. So what that ends up returning is the book name and then your new column called bigram. And it basically separates each phrase um, um, tokenize, it tokenizes each uh, sentences into sets of two words. Um, the approach I took, to be honest, with the although I love her examples with the Jane Austen books, I wanted to make uh, a, a little bit more realistic um, so that I could gain some actual context because I haven't read all like all the Jane Austen novels. It, so what I decided to do instead was I took some tweets related to COVID that were from Kaggle. I didn't actually pull them myself. Um, they're just publicly available on, um, on Kaggle. And uh, I included the link here. And I decided to do the same thing. The thing about this data set is that it also um, includes sentiment. So these, this person who developed this data set wanted to do, um, they did a sentiment analysis on COVID related tweets. So the, the data has um, the tweet itself, a lot of the metadata related to, to, to tweets, um, like what date it was tweeted, if it was a retweet, and then also a, which we covered sentiment analysis, it was the, um, uh, the uh, remind me what's it, the rating that is like positive, uh, extremely positive, neutral, negative, and, ne and extremely negative. It was like five, um, five levels. Um, so all I did was I decided to keep the original tweet itself and then the sentiment variable as like a grouping variable. So to kind of keep it um, aligned with how the uh, Jane Austen novels are analyzed. She always groups by book. Um, I decided to use the designated sentiment from the Kaggle dataset as my grouping variable. 
Okay, so um, I did the exact same thing. I created a bi I created bigrams from those tweets, and this is the um, the sentiment associated with the particular bigram. So you'll see here neutral, neutral. I don't know what this is. I don't know what this is. Um, these seem like tags. So this is somebody's, someone's username has been tagged and then a URL. So whenever you see in, in tweets, um, t.co, that's a shortened, uh, Twitter has shortened the URL. And so it's HTTPS, that's the protocol followed by t.co. Um, so there's a lot of, <laughs> there was a lot of URLs in this data set. So um, I was like, okay, we probably need to filter this out. Um, I took the bigram data set, I counted it. So clearly there are 23,000 of those words include, of those bigrams are links. So um, I, I believe I took those out. I filtered the HTTPS links. Um, there's also uh, stop words. Um, and I can't remember at this point if we've also gone over stop words, but those are basically uninteresting words like of, the, be, don't, can't. Sometimes the conjunctions are also considered stop words depending on what, uh, ver what, um, data set for stop words that you use. There are several out there. And, and actually I read ahead a little bit um, into the other book and there was, they mentioned that there was a study done a couple years ago where they uh, examined like something like 80 different versions of stop word data sets and found an alarming rate of mistakes, such as like misspellings of words and words that actually aren't stop words that are could could actually be relevant. So like one data set had um I think like umbrella or car included as a stop word. Um yeah. Um, so yeah I think um Lel, um I understand um the issue you are trying to talk about some words appear in the um some couples which they are not actually stop words. So um, I literally had this um, couple of weeks um, where I also, um, uh, because I'm working on a couple for Nigerian languages and mm -hmm. in Twitter, you don't have, um, AP, the Twitter API does not allow you to query um, to get any language in Africa. So for example, if you want to tweet in English, Arabic, you can specify in the Twitter API that I want to tweet in English or something. So we don't have that in, uh, for any of the African languages. So, um, I try to get tweets um, from Twitter. And one way for me to get tweet is to um, create stop word. And after I create a stop word for a particular language with most frequent ta um, terms appear in that language. Now I can use those stop word as a vector to pass into Twitter. All tweets, um, I would say, okay, for location Nigeria, but all tweets containing this word, this stop word, bring it. So it means it will return tweet in particular language. But it turns out when I created this stop word, I see some word that are not stop. For example, um, in some language, I will see Allah in some, because mm -hmm. that text corpus is religious corpus. So Allah is mm -hmm. mentioned many times, oh God. So what I did was like to create, get two different corpus, three different corpus from three different domains. For example, sport, religion, and this. So when I created this corpus, so I set the uh, intersection of the stop word from each corpus, the one that appears in each of the three couples. So that way I will have a, a stop word that for a language that does not actually depend on the particular couples. Yeah, so this is one way I uh, solve the issue of having some words that uh, in particular stop word. The problem is they use a couples and in that couple, there are some terms that appears most often, which are relevant mm -hmm. for that couples. Yeah. Right. Um I, I think that's I think that's appropriate because when I was reading that subsection in the other book, mm -hmm. um, the that's essentially how they were saying you would have to create your own because they they were suggesting that you know if 
a particular stop word data set doesn't apply or it doesn't fit your need, you would most mm -hmm. likely have to create your own. And the, one of the ways to do that is to look at your corpus mm -hmm. and, and uh, basically get the frequency of all the words Mm -hmm. And the ones that are the most common would likely be your stop words, because what shows yeah. up the most common are mm -hmm. the V and B and A and, you know, what yeah. we typically see that are really just uh, words that connect other more meaningful words. Yeah. Um, and also there are domain specific stop words. So I also had a, a for my uh, package that I wrote for drugs. Um, there are things, there are words that are, are not interesting to me. So like, um, for example, milligrams or pills, like I want to know, I don't really care for my research purposes, the, the method of, uh, the way someone took a drug or their dosage. So anything that was related to dosage or their method, like oral injection or whatever was not was considered a stop word. So I created like a drug specific stop word in, on top of the one that came out of tidy text, for example. Um, and that, and that's, that's completely valid, like the domain specific ones. Um, so we do that here in the COVID, um, with the COVID bigrams data set, I just use the regular, uh, the stop words in the, in the tidy text package. Um, there is a data set called stop words and essentially before, and this was one thing I don't understand. I was actually having trouble in my own work, um, is we created a bigram and then you, in order to, to filter out the stop words, you have to separate the bigrams into their individ individual words. This is uh, from tidy our package, the separate function. And you have co column word one and word two. And then you filter out uh, word one is not in the stop words uh, vector called word. Word two is not in the stop words vector called word. Um, and which reduce that data set from uh, over a million uh, words to 393,000. And then you put them back. <laughs> you kind of like put them back. So the new bigram uh, counts um, when you count the unique words was 216,367. Then you take those two words and then you use the unite function from tidyr, which is the opposite of the separate to put those words back together. Conceptually, I understand why we have to do this, but I was having difficulty this week because you can also tokenize, which is an option in the unnest tokens function, you can tokenize by sentence, not by, un by n-gram. You, so you can tokenize by a whole sentence. And I, well, I needed to filter out stop words. And I was like, how am I gonna do this? when you when every sentence is a its own length you know i can't i can't designate you know new columns in the separate function new columns word one word two because i don't know how many every sentence has a different number of words does that make sense yeah you know what i mean so i this is a question i tried to find on stack overflow i think somebody like in 2000 you know, 10 had a very similar issue, <laughs> but nothing more relevant. So I, maybe they, this has been addressed or maybe I'm just, I, there's a very obvious solution that I'm missing, but um, I was like spending way too much time trying to figure out how to, you know, uh, basically use from, uh, I believe per has a function to um, uh, unnest the words. So basically you take a sentence and it, it basically breaks it out. But then I had to create like a unique identifier for each word and then pivot wider. <laughs> and then, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, not pivot wider. Uh, create that identifier, then filter by the stop words and then nest again those words, grouping by the original uh, 
ID and the unique identifier for the sentence itself. It was a very complicated process. And I was like, um, I feel like I'm doing this wrong. <laughs> yeah, um, if I understand, it, does that mean, okay, you want to unnest um, by, by sentences, right? And right. you want to, uh, do, do you want to remove the stop word for each sentence? Is that right? Yes, but I need to put the sentences back together though. Yeah, I understand. You want to put the sentences back together, right? Oh, okay. So for example, if you have two sentences and in these sen sentences, you have stop words. So you want to have this exactly two sentences without the stop word. Is that right? Yes. Uh, I think I have done something similar to that. It was a lot. I thought it would be simple, but mm -hmm. it was a little bit more tricky than I thought. I, I mean, I said what I... What I just described was the solution that I ended up taking, but it felt like it was a very inelegant solution that there may be something mm -hmm. a little bit nicer, a, di a nicer you, approach. Have you done it? I mean, I, I did it, but ah, okay. what I was saying is that I don't think it's elegant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I think I, yeah, think I did something ugly solution. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah. Can you, can you, here's, I've, I've been sitting here in, in uh, I was going to say deep thought, but, you know, however deep my thought goes, whatever level that is, that's where I was. I can't claim to say it's deep, but um, would you, uh, I've never, un, I've never tokenized by sentences, but would you be able to, to do that, to tokenize by sentences and then add an identifier for each sentence, um, sort of as metadata. So that's like your document now. And um and then what you do is then just tokenize by word as soon as you've done that. And then, um, and then you remove the stop words because you need, you need individual words for, to remove stop words, at least as they do in this book. Uh, and then you can put things back together. There's a fun, like using like glue collapse or, or paste or something. Um, that's, what, that's what occurred to me. That that's essentially what I ended up doing. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So I yeah I, I just heard per and I was like oh per that sounds like lists and stuff and I was like oh I was wondering if you just yeah it so in. maybe that I I probably could have used collapsed or glue that probably would have been better but in my head I was like I'm just gonna use like the nest function, um, <laughs> but the uh, but that's essentially what I did I I, I essentially with the uh, separate what separate does is it turned my all my sentences into like one long uh, vector of individual words mm -hmm. and then um, I did that filter uh, this step right here mm -hmm. but I still had that like uh, unique identifier for each sentence attached to it uh, as a separate column so I knew which sentence that word belonged to and then I had to do a group by, and then um, uh, I think it was Nest. I might have it confused with a, a different, but essentially uh, reconcatenate those those words to reform a string again. And I may have my function confused with something else, but that's essentially the approach that I took. Okay, at least I'm not the only one. That's that's validating to me. At least I'm not the only one thinking about that. Um, all right, so moving forward. Um, so we did the filtering of the stop words and we ended up from a million, uh, over a million records to a data frame of 216,000. Um, I just made a comment, clearly there are a lot of people posting links on Twitter because of all the shortened URLs, we filtered out the stop words. So now let's make the true bigrams without the stop words. So we unite them again using the unite function. And I could have sworn I filtered them out, but I, I guess I left them. I don't know why. I really should have filtered out the HTTPS and t.co because that's annoying. <laughs> Um, anyways, um, and then, okay, so then we go on to say, uh, in the chapter, she uh, kind of reiterates with trigrams. So um, we take 
the same approach by using unnest tokens, except instead of n equals two, we do n equals three. We create word one, word two, word three, and uh, we separate by the space between the words and then filter out the stop words and do a count. And then we see again, uh, word one is coronavirus. That's the most common word. COVID-19, COVID-19 together, 19. Grocery store workers is the sixth most common trigram in COVID-19 outbreak. Um, all right, so let's talk about how we analyze these digrams and trigrams. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to do was to do just like a, a common frequency where we took the first word in our bigram and look at how, um, how often they occur in our, our um, I guess our, this would be called our document. Uh, our, our documents, our document. I don't know if I'm using that, um, that correctly. Um, but it looks like the, one of the most common words is online for word one and then grocery. So online grocery shopping is probably what a lot of people were doing at this point in time, which makes complete sense uh, contextually. Um, yeah, so she basically said biograms can be treated like documents. So another way to see how frequently the um, words occur and how significant they are in relation to your document is through something called TF-IDF. Um, and TF-IDF, that is the, um, we, we did that in chapter three, that is term frequency and inverse document frequency. Um, and that basically tells us, uh, you know, TF is how frequent that word is in your document, and then IDF is the, um, how significant, like the weight. Um, so I wanted to do that and visualize it based on the, um, the calculated sentiment that was included in the data set. So by do, to do that, we took the count of the bigram of each of the bigrams, and used the function called bind tfidf, and then um, arrange it in descending order. So you could see the most um, um, the most influential words. So we have price war, stop panic, strong amp, terroristic threats, experience hardship which I don't know why this is extremely positive. Walmart trader and food shortages, most of them are negative. This is COVID-19 tweets, so it makes sense that most of these are negative. Um, and then friends are safe, or positive. So to visualize it, um, we take that data set, uh, the resulting data set with the TFIDF and group by the sentiment um, category. And uh, we took the first 15 uh, of each group. Within each grouping, we take the top 15 uh, by grants and then use ggplot to um, do a bar graph of TFIDF uh, measure and fill it with this, this sentiment. Um, and then you facet wrap by sentiment. So remember how I said I was using that as our grouping variable. In the in the book, she does that by um, the Jane Austen novel. So it's like Pride and Prejudice and Emma and Mantle Park and all that stuff. Um, so we can see in the extremely negative, it's, it's a little bit um, hard. I probably should have just taken the top like five, but the um, one of the most um, influential is price war. And then we have stop panic under the extreme, <laughs> extremely negative. And then under positive, we have Brad Paisley for some reason. It was the most very influential under extremely positive. Uh, sorry, positive and then strong amp. So I'm not entirely sure what that refers to. Um, 
So I basically, I wrote here the takeaway that biograms are informative and can make tokens more understandable. They don't, they do make the counts more spare, sparse, sorry. Um, so make, meaning that um, it's getting two words, uh, analyzing two words together uh, is more rare than just looking at words individually, but can be very useful when you have really large data sets. Okay, so then she goes on to uh, provide context and sentiment analysis. So these biograms, this data set already had uh, sentiment included as a variable, um, but I kind of wanted to see uh, what happens uh, if I redid it, because um, it didn't. It, it's not. Uh, it's pretty trivial to do in this package. So. Um, I wanted to see what the difference were. So I, I took the, um, the bigrams, the bigram separated data set. The bigram separated data set, um, just a reminder, was the, um, the data set that had uh, the words one and word two variables. So they had, they had just had the stop words filtered out and then that's it. We didn't re we haven't reunited them in this data in this data frame. Okay, so taking those individual words, so we have word one, word two, and we have the frequency. You see that there are a um, a lot of knots before, so not going, not only, not to, um, and that are ne negative expressions. Those are called like negative expressions, if I remember correctly. Um, in this example, I, I use the AFIN um, to get the sentiments, um, but we also wanted to get uh, the most frequent words preceded by not. So what I did was um, get those bigrams the, that have been separated and filter the, filter the data set, the data frame, where word one is equal to not, and then join by a uh, interjoin by the AFIN sentiment data set so that we can get that value from one ne uh, neg negative three to positive three. Um, so then we can see what the not words are. So we see what actually happens what this is actually telling us is that this is giving us a very negative, um, in this is giving us a very negative emotion, like a negative sentiment, panic. However, we know that in the bigram, it is preceded by not. So this is actually not panic, which negates the sentiment. So what we're gonna do here uh, next is we are going to see how influential some words are so we can understand the context and like how influential they are in giving you context in the wrong direction. So if you were to really just look at the sentiment analysis, you would be like, oh my God, there's a lot of panic. But to understand what it's preceded by, could inf you, get a you get a better sense of the big picture, right? Um, and you know that these words are actually preceded by not. So we take those not words and we calculate, uh, we just take their, um, their frequency and multiply it by their value, like their like negative three, for example, um, for panic, for example, that was the value assigned to sentiment uh, as the sentiment extremely negative and how many times it occurred. And then um, we arranged the um, data frame by in descending order by that contribution. And then we plotted that contribution um, in relation to its, um, uh, the, the second word. Um, so for example, here is, yeah, so here's the sentiment value, which is the number of occurrences. So it's the value times the number of occurrences and then the actual word that was preceded by a not. So not good 
and not panic. So panic is like the most influential word here um, because it occurred like more than 200 times, the word panic. Um, but we know that it was preceded by a not. So you would, def you would basically inverse, um, inverse that. So if we were to try that again with a few more negation terms, so I created this factor called not, no, never, without, and did the same thing essentially. Um, the only one that came up was no out of these, um, out of this vector. Um, and we get essentially the same, almost the same results. So uh, no panic, not panic. Uh, we have no, sh no shortages, uh, no problem, no doubt, no shortages, shortage, shortages, just plural. Um, and no joke, no matter, no good. So uh, I guess you can see how this is, uh, it's important to take in mind when, you're, when you do bigrams the negative expressions when you're analyzing those bigrams because it could actually inverse the, the meaning of what you're, um, the actual meaning. All right, so the um, last part was visualizing, oh wait, no, that wasn't it. Oh, is this the, okay, so uh, I'm just gonna rush through this part so this is actually visualizing a network of bigrams using um, kind of like a, a knowledge graph approach. Um, for some reason, I couldn't get iGraph installed on my computer. Um, it kept giving me an error and I even tried to get it off of GitHub. I could not, I could not get it in to install properly. Um, but essentially um, you basically take it's like, an, it's like a network graph where you take a word and that is a node. And then another, there's another word that's another node. And then there are edges between these nodes that tells you the directionality of how these words are connected to each other. And let me just show you, I just caught, I just, uh, just copy and pasted the images from the, the book itself to give you an idea. So this is what, the, um, the code would look like to actually produce this. Um, and this is using the Jane Austen text um, uh, data. And you can see that miss is used a lot. So there's a lot of um, nodes coming out of the miss node, going to Miss Smith, Miss Crawford, and then Crawford to Henry. So you can see those relationships between words graphed out into nodes and edges. Does that make sense? All right, and then she does the same thing, but in a little bit prettier format where you can actually see the arrows and um, you can see thousand goes to pounds. So something costs either weighs or costs a thousand pounds versus pounds a thousand. Um, All right, and then this, the last section, which is um, I think pretty concise is counting and correlating pair, pairs of words. Um, so what's useful about this part is understanding where the words co-occur. So they don't necessarily have to be together like in the previous section with bigrams, but just knowing that they do co-occur is equally as useful. So um, for this example, I looked at the tweets that were only extremely positive uh, and then grouped them into chunks of 10 tweets. Um, so because, it, and I made a note here, by the way, the tweets span between March 1st and April 1st. So there's a month worth, month's worth of, of data. Um, but we wanted, so, and I made, I also made a, um, a little side note. It, the data came through, everything was a character. It probably would have been better to convert the tweet at like, after I'd already done this, I thought maybe I could have converted the, the date variable in, into an actual date format so that I can sort 
by it and so we can get the tweets in chronological order. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't have time to go back and, and redo that. So um, yeah, so this is a little bit, to me, it was a little bit confusing um, because in order to count uh, co-occurrences and correlate them, you have to convert the data into um, um, wide format. So kind of like in, in, in matrix, to be able to do matrix operations. And so there's a package called YDR that allows you to do, perform those matrix, op matrix operations like pairwise counts or correlations between two words in a, a more tidy fashion. Um, okay, so like I was saying, I took the original COVID tweets data and for simplicity, I just um, filtered out only the extremely positive um, tweets. Then I grouped them into chunks. So I created chunks of tweets, 10, 10 chunks of tweets at a time and labeled it um, and then filter any chunk greater than zero. So we don't want, you know, no tweets, chunks with no tweets in them. And then do the same thing with unnest tokens. And we did it this time just by word um, and then remove the stop words. So what you end up getting now is 123,000 rows with, that are extremely positive and then um, seven uh, records. So this is what this ends up looking like. So you see this is uh, the first chunk and then this is the first word. Uh, so this is all one tweet, right? But with the stop words removed and now we know that is part of, so this is like that identifier in a sense. Um, all right, and then so, to count the words that are co-occurring within a section, we um, take those that data frame, use a function from YDR called pairwise count, and that essentially counts um, the words. This um, this uh, vector right here called word, um, and by the chunk, and then sort it. And so then you get um, item one, item two, and their frequency. <laughs> so a lot of, uh, again, a lot of links. These are all just links um, that co-occur in the in each chunk. So in each in each tweet. Oh my god, I can't speak. In each ten tweet chunk, there are a lot of co-occurrences of links. Okay, I don't know if I'm making sense or not. Um, but outside of the link, so uh, what I did was I took the those word pairs and I filtered, um, it looked like uh, after I scrolled down a bunch that's COVID-19 and store were really popular, were like the next popular things outside of the link, outside of the HTTPS and TICO. Um, and so I filtered the item equals store, so we can get a better uh, idea. Um, so we say store and a link. So this is probably like somebody's advertising shopping, store coronavirus, store 19, store COVID, grocery shopping, supermarket, amp, food, store prices. So these are all the, um, the frequencies of these occurrences, these two words occurring together in the same chunks. Okay. Um, and then finally, we have pairwise correlation. Um, so pairwise correlation is, uh, we, is helpful to know with co-occurring words um, because even though like, so two words may co-occur together, they may not be uh, 
um, they're, they're, they may be individualistically um, meaningful, but we want to know the co-occurrences that are meaningful together. Does yeah. that make sense? What okay. is the relationship um, with this, with word embedding? What is the relation to this, this word embedding? You know I don't what think I understand your question. Okay, you know what embeddings, right? Uh, yeah. Right. Um, so, um, similar word co-occur in the same space. So this is more or less the same thing, right? Um, I just I don't I want to that... definitively say yes. I don't think that they really have anything to do with each other. Okay. Uh, I thought that word embeddings are, you know, like vector representations of words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Along, you know, different semantic dimensions. Mm -hmm. So you would take a word like dog. You know, it's, I honestly, I, I, I don't know, but I mean, it would be like a, have a positive element, maybe like a, canine or well not canine uh like mammal something i don't know but it doesn't but that's like getting at what a presumably in our human minds you know we have these like representations of words along different semantic dimensions but i don't think it necessarily has anything to do with like the co-occurrences so i guess the way i would think about it is the word embedding is like a deep representation of a word whereas these pairwise correlations they stay out that stays on the surface, like what is literally as a part of text, mm -hmm. right? Like there's toilet paper and paper toilet COVID-19. I'm just looking at the, yeah. the, the text there, right? It's not yeah. the first thing that comes to my mind. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's actually a good point. Like, um, so I like how um, um, Justin, yeah. did I get that right? right? Okay. Um, was saying that it's kind of more like on the surface because we are looking at just how um, how the correlation among the words uh, like appear together mm -hmm. um, instead of how they appear separately as we've been doing so far. Yeah. Like you, we want to put like a, you know, um, this uh, coefficient, this um, correlation coefficient is pretty good. Paper and toilet and toilet and paper are very correlated to each other mm -hmm. um, in the corpus of text that we're using. Yeah. So I think I have to agree with Justin on this one. Um, yeah. So. It's coming to me on top of like um, embeddings, it take care of like even semantic, you know, but this is just like, um, you, it's just for a, um, a co correlation or co occurrence between the words in the corpus. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I get you. Yeah. So I, maybe I think you might be thinking a little bit, um, maybe a little bit. A couple steps ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think I get what I think I get what you're getting at. Um, but this is simply just to kind of analyze. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on a on a more um. Yeah. A high higher level, like here mm -hmm. are these words, and then let's visualize how they occur together, and then let's mm -hmm. actually do yeah. a statistical test to analyze how they occur together. If they're if it's actually are these you know. Are they actually correlated? Are these two words actually correlated and yeah. instead of just occurring together individualistically? Yeah. And, and so we see here they they do. Yeah. In the next book we're gonna do there is a particular chapter called embedding. And yeah. I think that I I, I, I know what you're like talking that. about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm interested in that as well. <laughs> okay. So we um yeah, so we see hand sanitizer, sanitizer in hand, nurses and doctors, doctors and nurses, <laughs> COVID-19. These are all pretty heavily correlated. Mm -hmm. 
And then I just did it one more time. Let's see the words most correlated to store. So I, I just filtered mm -hmm. um, that data frame with, to store. And we see grocery, mm -hmm. employees, um, okay. workers. The correlation coefficients are not that uh, high mm -hmm. relative to toilet paper like we saw. But this was, mind you, like the very beginning stages of COVID, <laughs> like the very first month. So people were less interested in stores and more interested in toilet paper. So uh, yeah, so we can do that for multiple words and we can look at their correlation coefficient. Uh, we can visualize them um, in bar graphs. So really the same um, approach filtering the items by, I, I, I just picked some that I thought were more interesting, like store workers, online and sanitizer, and then take the top six words that are correlated and um, arrange them and facet by the, um, the original item. So the most correlated words uh, to sanitizer is hand, to online is shopping, the store is grocery, and workers is staff and drivers. Um, and that's it. <laughs> That is, makes sense. So to me, that makes, uh, given that we've lived through um, March 1st, sorry, March 30th to April 30th, this contextually makes sense. <laughs> That's what people were tweeting about, in my opinion. Any questions? Good talk, as, as always. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think this is very nice chapter. And the content is so relevant in um, most of the, I mean, for example, where I do also for kind of this stuff. Um, yeah, I, think, um, I agree. Yeah. Even for me, I have to like revisit like this stuff. Um, I'm really looking forward to the next book, but I, I needed to refresh my memory on like a lot of these, uh, what seemingly basic concepts. Um, so this was a good exercise. Um, but yeah, so I have this chapter and I will be pushing it, um, pushing my changes so that they can, it shows up as two, but I don't know, I, I'm like, uh, actual, Chapters two and threes have not been pushed to my knowledge because I pulled the latest version of the repository. Um, so, but regardless, I'm going to be pushing this there. <laughs> okay, that sounds uh, good. Right. So, um, I think next week we'll have just the right um, to give us um, uh, topic modeling. Um, yeah, awesome. Can, yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Leila. Um, no worries. Thank you guys for listening. Okay. See you all, all next right. week. See you next week. Bye, guys. Bye. Ciao, ciao.